uh, in spite of all that, he'll give us a talk on cascade models and fusion plasmas. All right, sir. All right, thanks, Pat. Thank you for accommodating me, even even though I'm not there. So, um, actually, today, in the spirit of um, the quotation that Guillaume shared with us in his welcome talk from um, Predimancal, uh, namely that festival is where we talk about things we don't understand. I'll talk about something that I don't understand, which is the uh, turbulent cascade in fusion plasma. So I'll talk about this in the context of cascade models. Let's see where this takes us. Uh, so this is the outline I thought I would have when I started writing this talk. So, um, and, but I will wander around and go into other subjects and rant about the situation, you know, state of the study of turbulence in fusion plasmas. So basically I start by introducing turbulence in fusion plasmas, sort of like a preface and then talk about what has worked in the past in the case of uh, basic models, reduced models, uh, short history of that. Then I'll wander into the turbulence uh, of Asegawa Wakatani and show you maybe some, some results from that, those and ba basically complain that we don't understand even those kinds of simple models and then discuss some cascade models and applications of those and eventually conclude. So uh, turbulence, uh, when we try to define turbulence, we realize that turbulence is not chaos. It's not chaotic dynamics by itself. It's not even chaos in across a range of scales. Uh, we can sort of try to define it as the duality of chaotic dynamics and hierarchical organization, which is sort of chaos, but the organization pushing against each other across a large range of scales. Uh, it's an artifact of a particular kind of nonlinearity, namely the advective nonlinearity. And while uh, canonical problems of turbulence, such as Navier's Stokes equation, are rather limited in scope. Turbulence is everywhere in nature. All, all physics problems have some kind of trouble with turbulence, and they have to understand it. And it's even beyond that, this nonlinearity is sort of the, the thing that makes uh, structures possible. So understanding turbulence is of great interest in general in physics. Uh, so plasma turbulence is also of interest is an intellectually challenging problem because it's, uh, you know, it's turbulence in fluids is already complicated when you include electromagnetic fields, it becomes even more complicated, but this is relevant somehow to an engineering problem, uh, which might define the future of our planet. Uh, plasma turbulence has many flavors like MHD, Vlasov uh, equation, gyrokinetic equation, etc. Uh, I'll show this a little bit. Uh, simpler non trivial descriptions, such as Asegawa Wakatani, for example, are really useful in understanding its key features. So, uh, Asegawa Wakatani, I see it as the simplest non trivial description of plasma, whereas Asegawa Mima, I see it as the simplest description of plasma, which makes it sort of like a trivial description in some sense. Uh, such a description allows a detailed comparison to reduce models. So when we are, for example, using something like Asegawa Wakatani as the basis uh, of your description is interesting because then uh, this is something you can almost understand and when you derive reduced models, like the K-Epsilon model, for example, that we saw in the earlier talk by Eriksa, uh, we can actually compare in a detailed way the, the, all the details of the equations, et cetera. We can have a high resolution version, low resolution version, you know, these kinds of things. So 
Cascade processes can be modeled using different approaches like shell models, differential approximations, closures, wave kinetic equation, etc. cetera, in, in fusion plasmas as well as in general. So these things uh, we have used in the past, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully. Uh, and knowledge acquired from studies of the Charney Hasegawa Mima model, uh, which is sort of our trivial example, it can guide us, but can't be the final word because uh, the many of the problems that we face in fusion plasmas have features that are not describable by Charney Hasegawa Mima model. <clears throat> so results from these models can guide studies of more realistic models like gyrokinetic equations, et cetera. So uh, the idea of different kinds of descriptions of a plasma, I must have shown this in the past in the festival. So the idea is we have the most complete description, which is the Klomontovich description, which deals with N equations for N particles plus Maxwell's equation. We do a BBJKY reduction to go to Vlasov Boltzmann description where we have one equation in six dimensional uh, space and plus the Maxwell's equations. This reduction is rather robust. Then we can reduce it further by assuming strong magnetic field so that we have uh, basically one equation in 5D or 4D plus reduce Maxwell's equation. This could be reduced further by making the assumptions of electrostatic turbulence, etc. So gyrokinetics is usually what we use in, in the studies of fusion when we are trying to do realistic simulations. We can take moments of this to derive gyrofluid equations. These are usually n moment equations, which n smaller than 16 with proper 3D geometry, et cetera. We can make the assumption of simple geometry, make further reductions to go to only two equations, we get the asegawa wakatani system. And then we, if we assume adiabatic electrons, C going to infinity, we get the hasegawa mima system. But one thing which is important probably is the, is the zone of flaws, existence of zone of flaws. And so we can, from this point on, we can keep the zone of flow uh, by uh, using a proper uh, a diabetic response or non adiabatic response in the Hasegawa Kitani system. So, the trivial system to me is the Hasegawa Mima plus zone of laws, which we understand, which we understand uh, almost profoundly. We don't understand everything, of course, but we understand much better than the other systems. Uh, I don't know who is in the room, so I won't make uh, long introductions about everything. So, I I assume most people in the room are either experts or they know what zone of flows are. So the, the basic idea is we use an equation like this, for example, this is what we call the Hasegawa Mima equation, where the fluctuations evolve in the presence of zone of flows and the zone of flows are driven by fluctuations. So this doesn't have to be zonostrophic in the sense that we can still keep the uh, this mode coupling term between the fluctuations and still uh, this remains from my point of view a trivial mode. And so K spectrum infusion plasmas is the, the top subject uh, of this talk uh, and many plasma turbulence problems can actually be formulated as potential vorticity advection problems. So we can make some general arguments based on this fact uh, that the simplest form, for example, for potential vorticity is, we can write it in this form, n minus del square phi, where del square phi is the vorticity and n is the density. And we can write the potential entropy budget, which has this form. Uh, so it has a divergence uh, of a flux in case space uh, form plus production and dissipation. Uh, so the, the basic idea in 2D turbulence, and this is also we are in sort of 2D or quasi 2D system, uh, is that we inject energy and there's an inverse energy cascade and there's a forward entropy cascade, which is dissipated at uh, high K. 
and the energy might be dissipated at uh, low K by some kind of friction uh, process. So when the, in contrast to this, when the interaction with zonal flow dominates, so we have a large uh, zonal flow in some sense, uh, the, the flux can be divided into a local and a non-local bit, which is driven by the zonal flow wave number here, Q. Uh, and the non-local bit can be written in this form. And this gives a limiting form for the entropy spectrum, which has K to minus two form. So this becomes K to minus four for energy, if you will. But when you write it for, <clears throat> for electrostatic potential or electron density, the, the, the thing that we measure in, uh, in real experiment, it has this particular form. And the idea here is we inject energy, the zone of law somehow acquires this energy in an anisotropic energy transfer, so it grows big and it dominates the the forward density transfer by zone of flow mediated forward density transfer. And when this is the main process, we get this kind of case spectrum. So this is compared to experiment using Doppler reflectometry measurements a long time ago. And we have some sort of agreement in some range of case space. This is basically, there are maybe better um, comparisons which were done later. And there are some comparisons which were done to simulations. So this somehow seems to work. Uh, the, the, the physics is it follows some interactions with the dominant large scale flows. And we know that in this case, in this particular plasma, we have GAMS at least, maybe zonal flows as well. But uh, this might explain this part of the, the match. But it doesn't match in this part, which is the, the more energy containing scales in some sense, but it's, uh, this part could be explained by quasi-linear theory. So we can do comparisons with gyrokinetic simulations in uh, Z-pinch geometry using GST. This was done by Sumire Kobayashi. Uh, and you can see the comparison with the uh, phi square here. So the, the same kind of quantity that we compare. And this is N square. This is, I think, the non-adiabatic part of the density. So this part, there's not much agreement. So this shows that there's some agreement with the theoretical prediction based on this desperate scale interactions with some gyrokinetic code. This suggests that DCIs dominate over local interactions in this case. And it actually leads to a dynamical spectrum. And we see that also in these simulations. Uh, if we put some large scale zone of flow damping, which damps the zone of flow in a time scale related to that damping, it generates predator prey uh, oscillations that we can clearly observe in the system. The, the idea is the cascade model with disparate scale interactions leads to predator prey like dynamics, which can be described in this form in K space. So we have the energy injection. The energy that we inject is reflected by zonal flows, but actually it first feeds the zonal flow. So we have the zonal flows which go up. So during that time, the, the, the energy accumulates and the zonal flow go up. And then it results in a rapid refraction by the zonal flow and dissipation. So when the, this happens, the zonal flow also decays afterwards because there's a dissipation also at large scales. And we can, I think I've shown that in, in some festival in the past where I was trying to uh, show data-based model reduction, basically the, the idea that we can do this uh, clear predator-prey uh, dynamics is observed in, this, in these simulations. And we can obtain actually lotka voltaire system either using uh, the, the methods that uh, Steve talked about uh, two days ago or yesterday, uh, uh, like Cindy, for example, or we can obtain, in this case, if we are confident that we have a Lotka Voltaire system, we can obtain the coefficients 
the advantage of uh, directly using a model like this is that you don't have the issue with noise because you don't compare, you directly compare time traces instead of comparing time derivatives. So anyways, bottom line for the trivial case is that this, this is basically our understanding uh, for the, the case when zonal flows dominate and we have potential vorticity evolution plus potential entropy forward cascade mediated by zonal flow. So through dispersed scale interactions leading to predator prey dynamics. This is sort of the, the robust part of the thing that we understand. And this is coincident with Pat's vision of plasma turbulence as I understand it with wave kinetic equations, zonal flows, self-regulating shear flows, et cetera. So this is the thing that we clearly understand. This is the robust part of our uh, perception of, about plasma turbulence. And it works even for gyrokinetics, but sometimes. And it's probably sufficient in a, in a self selective ignorance sense. We don't need to understand every little detail in order to use uh, this, uh, for example, to make even to make predictions. Do we really, for example, need to understand case space energy transfer beyond this uh, basic framework? It's probably true that resonant interactions play a role in this picture, especially at medium scales. However, even for Chani Hasegawa MIMA model, wave turbulence formulation gets extremely complicated when we include zone of flows because zone of flows are self generated and basically they break down this uh, basic assumptions of wave, wave turbulence, at least formal wave turbulence. Uh, it's not clear if formal wave turbulence can be applied in the presence of zonal flows, let alone when we include growth plus, plus self-consistent zonal flows. So it seems the next best thing is still the wave kinetic equation, but I'd like to note that none of this actually works for a Hasegawa-Wakatani system, which is a simple system with C equals kappa equals one. This is sort of discouraging in a sense. This is the, the generic Asegawa Wakatani uh, case where this uh, perspective doesn't work as well as we would like it to. So uh, I'm talking about Asegawa Wakatani already. So it, let me introduce what it is for people who may be in the room who maybe don't know Asegawa Wakatani. It consists of an equation of vorticity like this, so it's sort of like Euler equation, this part, and an equation for density, which is uh, which would be a passive scalar if we didn't have these terms. So we have these three terms, which couple those, and phi tilde here means we have the fluctuating part of the uh, of the electrostatic potential and uh, the density, and those are the total uh, fluctuating plus the mean part of phi. So this includes, in some sense, the proper zonal response. Uh, kappa here is the diamagnetic drift velocity, which generates the wave motion, sees the adiabaticity parameter that we talked about before. And then there are some dissipation terms. It has the same nonlinear structure with passive scalar problem, uh, for example, thermal convection and many other problems. It has two critical limits. One is C much smaller than, one, than the hydrodynamic limit where the two equations decouples and the adiabatic limit where you have strong coupling between the two equations. So you get Chani as a government equation. Uh, note that the potential vorticity in this case reduces from its general definition to just uh, this form. Uh, so if we look at who did something on the case spectrum of Asegawa Wakatani. Well, you find this paper Camargo in 95. This probably still remains the most detailed such analysis to this day. So basically we see case spectra. So this is the total energy. So including kinetic plus the internal energy. So this is internal energy. So the square of density. This is kinetic energy, usually what we call energy in fluid dynamics. And this is, I think, potential entropy as they define it. So the solid curve here is C equals one, 0 0.1, uh, 
dotted curve is one and dashed curve is c equals five. And all of these are for kappa equals one. And we see some, so this is 512 by 512 resolution. And we see some case spectra. They saw it's minus 3.1, 3.2, 3.5, etc. For So this is the main thing we look at. This is sort of like the EK that we know. And this would be K, so we can argue that this is actually K to minus three, but because of coherent structures, it appears steeper. This is the usual argument for 2D turbulence. So this suggests we can actually use usual 2D with forward potential entropy cascade. I mean, sounds great. And they look at quasi-linear theory. It works pretty well as well, at least for these parameters. But I want to show you what happens in 2D turbulence in simulations in fluid community. So th these are simulations by Bofetta. These are, I think, the most uh, co complete such simulations already to this date. So this is in 2010. And these are the resolutions of the different cases. This is the this is the, their effort at trying to see the dual cascade. So we want to see the dual cascade, and this is k to minus five thirds here, and this is k to minus three. Effectively, when we don't have a lot of scales, it's steeper, but uh, it slowly approaches this uh, this picture, but. If we want to resolve the dual cascade in 2D turbulence, the, the bottom line is we need a resolution like 32,000 by 32,000. Whereas, okay, we are not really trying to do dual cascade here, but we have some interesting, we don't have a pure inertial range. I think we agree on that. And we have this kind of resolution. Oh, okay, this is 95. Let's see what happened afterwards. So. Uh, what we have in, instead in the in like closer to our day, usually nobody shows k spectra. Uh, for example, I have this paper by Dal Sarto, which does a quite good detailed analysis of Hasegawa Wakatani. This is an example from Hasegawa Wakatani, so this is why I use it, but basically follows what's standard in the field and shows that spectrum for the toroidal number. So this is 3D case. So we have toroidal mode number, which would correspond maybe to KY in my case. But well, we see it in linear and then the mode numbers go up to 40. I mean, this is kind of what we have also from gyrokinetic simulations, kind of impressive. And this is another simulation from 2007 by Numata. And the resolution is 256 by 256. So we have maybe some range, but it's not very conclusive. I mean, when compared to these guys, what these guys were doing at the, more or less the same time. So Wouter has worked on Hasegawa Wakatani. I looked at his papers. He has some, some results. So his problem, okay, he's interested in some other thing, but he uses Hasegawa Wakatani as an example. He's trying to uh, extract coherent spectrum from the, the full spectrum using some wavelet analysis. And we see that the, the coherent part is K to minus two in this case for, so this is W, uh, Entropy. I think entropy is defined as the usual kinetic entropy in fluid dynamics. But these simulations, first of all, they don't have zonal flow response. So this is what we call the, the standard Asegawa Wakatani, and the resolution is still 512 by 512. In 2011, we had the same resolution with Camargo 95. And I don't know if I have shamed some of you into showing case spectra with better resolution because I know some of you do Hasegawa uh, Wakatani simulations. So um, we have this paper by Gantus, in, uh, Katie Gantus, in 2015, where we actually tried to detail the cascade process into especially looking at internal energy. 
looking at different possibilities, uh, where one can define a sort of uh, transition scale where the eddy turnover rate becomes equal to the parallel electromobility. So this scale, some sense smaller scales and this become sort of more like adiabatic and larger scales become more like hydrodynamic. In that sense, makes sense the zone of flows are hydrodynamic in some sense. So the, the spectra we get from here, uh, you can see the different cases here, particularly we, we make the assumption that we have the usual dual cascade here, where the energy is injected at some scale, and then we look at internal energy. So we get minus five thirds if it's uh, adiabatic, and then 11 thirds if it's, sorry, if it's hydrodynamic and 11 thirds if it's adiabatic, and it, uh, splits into these two different cases for if it's uh, a diabetic, at least part of it is a diabetic. Uh, for the case when we inject energy at a large scale. Um, so the the argument from uh, wait, what the, this is this? I'm not sure why is this here. So the, this is basically talking about what we have seen here for some reason. So I'll just drop that. Um, okay, now we have these case spectra and my, um, in fact, our confidence in these spectra is rather low. Uh, and because, for example, this goes up to, I don't know, 10 to five, uh, whatever that means for Hasegawa Wakatani is not very clear because already the finite Lama radius breaks down at k equals two. So, but uh, the fact that these don't really correspond to a physical k spectra, uh, may, of course, is a problem in itself if you're trying to apply this to an actual physical problem, but uh, in fact, we use these kinds of ideas uh, in order to justify certain things that we do. So I think it's still important to understand what the case spectrum for the Hasegawa Wakatani implies. For example, we do gyrokinetic that can go up to uh, K per rho i equals the ratio of rho i to rho e, where we look at in interactions between ETG and uh, ITG, for example but somehow we can't handle uh, Hasegawa Wakatani up to this level. So my point of view is to take Hasegawa Wakatani as a mathematical problem and forget about its assumptions and see what it gives in full case space. So I'll show you some uh, movies if I still have time. Uh, so these are basically examples of what Hasegawa Wakatani does in different parameters. So this is uh, the case where, I don't know if you see or see this properly. Uh, so here is a case where the turbulence is hydrodynamic and we see behavior that looks 2D somehow, but we don't really have the inverse cascade in this case that uh, that leads to accumulation of uh, large K. So if I plot the K spectra for this case, so this was a simulation which was 1024 square. And the K spectrum for energy looks like this. So we get the K to minus 3.5, sort of consistent with Camargo actually. And that here I show the growth rate as a function of KY, even though this is K otherwise. And the blue curve is the, the zonal component. So in this case, the zonal component is basically just the, the one of the case of the isotropic component. So this is what we see for the density case. So this is F of K, internal energy. And again, we see maybe it's even a steeper K spectrum here, which is maybe consistent to the this small 
uh, the hydrodynamic limit in this case. So this is the case where C equals kappa equals one and the, the simulation has 2048 uh, square resolution. So this will be more interesting in some sense. And we see some behavior that resembles standard 2D turbulence. And we see formation of zone of laws and we see other things in some sense. This, because of the fact that the zone of laws are there, it messes up some of the 2D like dynamics. So the, the reason for looking at this uh, if we look at one of the structures, for example, its arms, how it rolls around, et cetera, gives us some idea about the, the type of turbulence we have. This looks indeed like two-dimensional two turbulence in some sense, but there are other details which don't look so much like two-dimensional turbulence. And he, he, this is density and this is uh, vorticity. So in the end, this is what we want to be able to explain. So we have coherent structures, we have zone of flows and we have other things. And the, the case spectrum we get is still uh, 3.5. And in this case, we actually uh, have this zone of flow peak, which dominates over the full spectrum. So if we look at what is the most uh, observable feature in this turbulence. This, this is the zone of flow actually that we see here. And it's also interesting to me that the, the, the maximum of the growth rate corresponds roughly to the maximum of the, the case spectrum. So this is something at least maximum of the non-zonal case spectrum. So if you look at KY spectrum in some sense, this is the maximum which corresponds to, to the maximum of gamma. But there's almost no change in the case spectrum when we go from positive gamma to negative gamma. So the gamma itself, we don't have a drop suddenly here of the, the case spectrum or some, some such thing. So the, the fact that this part of the case spectrum already gamma becomes not so important. Um, so this is the, the density spectrum as opposed to the energy, kinetic energy spectrum. And then I have one last uh, movie to show, which shows the, the limit where kappa is small, but the, the, I show it in a way where it's accelerated. So kappa also defines the time scale. Um, so it's effectively C is larger than uh, kappa in this case, and we see more uh, more zone of flows, and the zone of flow generation becomes stronger. And depending on what we put as zone of flow damping, we can observe either uh, more oscillatory behavior or, in the end, zone of flows dominating completely. So this now doesn't look so much like the 2D turbulence in some sense. It looks, but it doesn't look like Hasegawa Mima by itself either. So it looks like something in between, at least the zone of flows become, at the point when the zone of flows become dominant, it actually is, there are cases, there are places, for example, like around here where the zone of flows are they have almost completely killed the large fluctuations. There are some small fluctuations which remain, but the, so these, for example, around here, we might be able to describe this system with a, a wave turbulence approach, but of course, wave turbulence approach, which somehow takes the zone of flow as input, which is not satisfactory, of course. So this is the, the final result in some sense. I don't know, this simulation is longer for some reason. And in the end, if we plot the case spectrum, this is what it looks like. So it's still not too far, but it's, uh, so we have K to minus four. Again, a similar picture, except the zone of flows now 
uh, are even more pronounced in some sense. And this is the case spectrum for the uh, internal energy. And another thing I did is to, I looked at the uh, case spectrum at a given uh, position in X. So I took a, a particular space location in X and did a Fourier transform in KY and omega. So this is basically what we would look for if we had wave turbulence. And uh, this is the, the energy of omega and KY. And we see normally some, uh, basically we, we should be able to see the dispersion relation in these curves. And we see some, some dispersion relation, but these are at different spatial positions. So at each spatial position, naturally we have a different omega because the, the zone of law acts uh, in a different way. So uh, having studied uh, in some detail Hasegawa Wakatani turbulence, we can try to uh, build a sort of uh, understanding of it. First of all, uh, if you look at some myths about plasma turbulence, we can uh, do some myth busting. Uh, plasma, for example, there is this idea that plasma turbulence can saturate by coupling to damped nodes at the same scale. So you don't need a cascade, you can basically saturate at the same scale. This is true for a single triad or a bunch of triads maybe, but the network of many triads do not saturate uh, by this kind of mechanism. For, uh, I, in order to test this, I did uh, I built a, a network of triads in uh, Hasegawa Wakatani system. So the here what I show is Q, which is the zonal wave number. So these are different zonal wave numbers. And these are the nodes that correspond to different wave numbers. So, and I have a KY, uh, one mode with a, with a particular KY, which is about one point something. And uh, and these all other modes, which have the opposite uh, KY. Of course, I have the reflections of all these. And then I have a bunch of zonal modes, which have KY equals zero. So this provides a network. This network, if, if you will, is equivalent to the model that, uh, for example, Yannick, Yannick Sarazan dis, uh, discusses in one of his recent papers, where uh, basically you have a single KY, and you have, but you solve the equation at each spatial position. Uh, and you assume that there's only this kind of interaction. This is equivalent in some sense to that because we have, if we uh, Fourier transform that on X, we get these bunch of different Qs, but you still have a single KY. So in this model, uh, if you actually keep only triads, which have uh, unstable modes that, that has gamma plus greater than zero. They have also gamma minus, which is the, the damped mode, which is negative. Uh, so they should be able to saturate even if we only have unstable modes because they will couple to their damped uh, partners. But in fact, in such a system, there's no saturation. The system blows up unless we allow uh, the, unstable modes, which are uh, uh, plus modes, which has gamma smaller than zero, which means it, it's a dissipative range, basically. You have dissipation, which is larger than growth rate. Unless you have a dissip dissipative range, this kind of system does not uh, saturate uh, in a network. So another myth is that we have dual cascade. It's, uh, it's possible we have dual cascade in some cases, but it's not very clear. We sometimes say we have wave turbulence, that is the uh, resonances are important. This is definitely true for large scales, uh, but first of all, it's probably not exact resonances. Exact resonances are not essential. This is also another uh, result that I've looked at in this paper. Um, and, and it's not clear actually we have wave turbulence uh, in the full case spectrum because there is 
the fact that we can have this transition so easily from large scales to, to, to small scales suggests that we have a possibility of making this transition. There's no wave turbulence as a separate, completely distinct theory, and the Kolmogorov type turbulence is a distinct theory. So the idea is we need to have a coexistence of uh, wave turbulence, the Kolmogorov type turbulence, and interactions of disparate scales in order to be able to describe this kind of turbulence. We have basically elongated triads. This can go back to the, to the idea that we have wave turbulence. But elongated triads, they play a role in the interactions, but it's not the, the full story either. So. Anyways, in, at the end, I talk about some, some models that we can use in order to model these kinds of systems. The approach that we seem to be moving in the direction of is that we argue that it is true that for small scales, okay, mode to mode interactions are similar to 2D cascade. It's mostly forward cascade. And we can use these uh, using differential approximations, late models. For example, there's one by Pierre recently uh, doing uh, for passive scalar, so that we have also an equation for what I call FK here is called epsilon n here, and what I call E of K is called epsilon phi here. So we can write an equation uh, for the evolution of the, um, the K spectrum using these two equations for the, for the kinetic energy and for the internal energy. Now, of course, if you use only these, you get the usual dual cascade picture for the energy and some different uh, case for the passive scalar. But the idea of using these operators is that these can be used together with other terms representing zonal flow interactions or linear terms, et cetera, in some kind of wave kinetic like formulation. So here are my conclusions. Uh, so turbulence drives transport and magnetize fusion devices. We have to understand fusion plasma turbulence, but our understanding is rudimentary and we understand certain limits. We can simulate things obviously, but we have no universal theory, which deals with the fact that in most cases, we are in a coexistence of uh, weak wave turbulence, Kolmogorov kind turbulence, local cascade, and non-local cascade through interaction with zone of flows. This is actually fine for a superficial level of understanding as details of microturbulence may not be so important, for example, for controlling a reactor. But then we use these details to explain things. Again, uh, Eric Sarr's talk was a perfect example of this. He was trying to gen create a transport theory, but he was using the Kolmogorov uh, description for small scale turbulence in order to describe uh, the, the epsilon, the dissipation range, which is interesting. It's, we need to do probably better than this uh, if we understand the type of turbulence we have. Uh, so reduced models can be used efficiently in fusion studies. We can set up combined patchworks of these models like the one I described at the end here, these kinds of models can be used actually if you understand what you're doing, if you understand in what limit you are, and if you understand uh, why in order to model what you actually use these models. Uh, however, they don't seem to provide a coherent picture that encompasses even the simplest of the non-trivial systems, which is the Hasegawa-Katani system. Our lack of effort in detailed understanding of Microturbulence can probably be explained by lack of manpower and selective ignorance. We, I mean, I showed some case spectra that people have published in the past. It looks quite uh, um, bad, but in fact, this is usually explainable by the fact that today, for example, if I try to do very high resolution Hasegawa Wakatani simulations, I would probably not get any funding to do that. But it is probably arrogant in the end to think that we can upgrade know what to ignore in such a complex problem. So thank you for listening to me. 
and I don't hear anything, so I'll leave the floor to the to the chairman to ask me questions. I hope. I propose we, we operate in the following mode. So we, you know, you get recognized and you come up physically and you know speak to speak to Oscar here. He's sort of small and silicon and all. <laughs> and you you try to keep it short. So you know it's an it's not an invitation to make a speech, but I think that would go better than me repeating the question and we're going to have echo messes and all of that so questions all right xavier i would make it very short hey what's good on? hey short question what occurs if you switch off zonal flows in the simulation you show what about the case well i i did uh you see that the case spectrum at least the the slopes in the case spectrum for the non-zonal part seems to be robust so it is but the robust to the extent that if you say minus four is the same as minus 3.5 it's robust so uh, the the variation between different case spectra that i see between different cases are small and they are insensitive effectively to, to putting in or not the zone of flow. But the insensitivity var varies between the two predictions that sort of happens to, to be in the same ballpark. So for example, K to minus four for the energy could be explained either using Kolmogorov theory, but saying, okay, we have uh, large vertices somehow. So the vertices make the thing more peaked. This is one explanation. The other explanation is we have interactions with zonal flows which dominate. With th this would also give K to minus four for this case. Um, so, uh, I mean, in some sense, the, I think the way this can really be addressed is to do really high resolution uh, studies and look at the, the form of the uh, entropy flux, which I can calculate, of course, from these, these simulations. I didn't show that because it was noisy and not very interesting. But if, if I had higher resolution simulations, I think we can see the form of the, the entropy flux in case space and its dependence on the zone of low level. I think that would be, uh, that study might be able to separate the two mechanisms. Okay, thanks. All right. Hi, Oswald. Hi. Could you go back to the slide uh, 29? 29. Oh, yeah. Yes, that one. Um, I, I'm not yeah. sure I got your point regarding a dumped mode versus dissipated range. Man, yes. Could, yeah, could thanks. Comment on that. Thanks. That wasn't very clear, I think, in my explanation. So the idea that, for example, in the Asagawa Wakatani system, we have two eigenmodes, eigenmodes in the sense that we can, when we take the Fourier transforms, okay, we have 5k and nk. And we can combine these in two different ways to get the uh, pure uh, different frequencies. So the, the system has two, two different uh, solutions because it's uh, two, I mean, in even the linear part. So you have two different solutions and one is a growing mode in some range of K space at least. The other is a damped mode, which is always damped. So I, I, we can call them five, plus or chi plus or something here they are called chi plus in this picture chi k plus is the the growing mode and chi k minus is the damped mode so these are combinations of phi k and nk so in fourier space these are linear modes that are damped or um, unstable but we can consider interactions between 
KBQ, so we have triads. And in each of these interactions, we have, okay, a damped mode of the, for example, like one of these, I don't know, this picture is not very clear, but one of my triads contain this node, that node, and that node. And this triad basically uh, is a, uh, has each of these nodes has a chi k plus and chi k minus. So we can have interactions between these. And the idea is can, through these interactions, can I saturate um, without any actual dissipation or without any range of K space where some modes are dissipated. So because I have a damped mode in principle, I can imagine, okay, this guy couples to that guy, but that guy uh, somehow has a negative growth rate, so it will dissipate energy. So I can imagine I can saturate through interactions where energy is injected here and dissipated with the chi P minus here, for example. But uh, in such a way that all of the, the growth rates, the positive modes, the, the eigenmodes, which are normally unstable, are actually uh, gamma plus greater than zero. This is possible in a single triad. You can actually get some regular behavior, some sort of saturation, but it's not possible when you put a lot of triads together because the, uh, the, in the end, the, the damped modes become small enough that and uh, unless there's a reason why the, the growing modes cannot couple to one another, they prefer coupling to the to the guys which have larger amplitude than the guys which have very small amplitude. And uh, so apart from some phase problems, which would uh, cause, uh, which would make interactions between growing modes impossible, uh, there's no way that this kind of saturation is uh, possible in this system. So I don't know if this was, more understandable. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay. Well, I'm going to get in a question. I didn't see it. I had, a, I got a couple, but I'll give you one now. Uh, you interesting for all the goings on about zonal flows. You did not address the question of what is controlling the system in the limit of very weak zonal flow friction. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, gay heading toward the game of the tertiary and all of that. That's true. I, I, that, that, is, that, I mean, I think is a major relevant uh, question for practical matters because, you know, in a collisionless system, and it can be addressed within the house of cards of Hasegawa Wakatani, although I think maybe rather than this borderline case that you did, I'd go more to large alpha. But I mean, it works perfectly well in that limit. Maybe. It, I think you, you might be right. I, I didn't really address that. You're well, right. I mean, we have, and there are some yeah. surprises, okay? But that's, that's another discussion. I was curious if you had looked at that, so. Yeah, large alpha is harder to simulate for some reason. Yes. I, and I, de I decided, okay, what matters at least for this qualitative behavior is the ratio between C alpha and kappa. So I decided to reduce kappa and accelerate the, the movie or something. But well, I, I, I was lucky. I had an undergraduate who was a computer maniac and his father, <laughs> his father has a business and they've got a private computer. Oh, and, wow. and when we just took over. So. <laughs> All right, next question. Norman, were you, don't be bashful, come on. <laughs> Uh, hi, Oscar. I was wondering. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about. Uh, you plotted like the spectra with respect to different locations. Uh, is there? Yeah. Is there any sort of like 
uh, you mentioned like, oh, the spectra, depending on the zonal flows and things like that, yeah. do you see regions where the zonal flows have more or less influence or something along those lines or? Yeah, interesting, interesting point. I mean, the, the, this, this borderline case that, that I did actually, if we, I don't know if it will play now, but if we go a little bit further into this case and I stop, uh, so here, basically, I pick some, uh, the idea is I pick some places and I show the, the K spectrum or KY omega spectrum at a particular spatial location. So here, of course, you have some interesting thing because these things are rotating and they're moving in one direction. So the large scales will have a, um, will have one, uh, phase velocity and small scales will have another kind of phase velocity because of the rotation. But here, if I try to detect phase velocity, for example, there's nothing to detect more or less because there's no KY phase velocity in this region. And so it's similar to here as well. But what happens is when you see the, the effect of shear, so the shear is in between these two regions in some sense. So these guys are moving in one direction. So they, they more or less don't have any fluctuations, but these guys are moving in the opposite direction. So there is a big shear in between the two. So that region has a different effect, but I mean, this is basically what I plot directly from the numerical uh, analysis that I do. And it's already interesting to me to see that we have a almost a um, dispersion relation hidden somewhere because the, the final results look very nonlinear, but in some sense, it's not so much nonlinear if you think of the zonal flow as a, as a separate entity and look at the fluctuations only. So yes, in different regions, you see different characteristics. Also the, the, the features that this is very wide versus this is sort of, or this one is less um, broadband is also an interesting feature. This, this depends on the, the position and I'm not sure about the, I mean, it's obvious that the, the Doppler shift will make it and move it in one direction or the other direction, but I don't know about the, the effect of shear exactly, probably will make it more broadband, but I need to check it to, to okay. be sure this is the case. Oh, thanks. Mm. All right, I think, I think we have quiescence. So I guess people can, if they want, can hang ar around and speak with Oscar. But otherwise, I think we call it. So let's all right. Let's thank Oscar again. Thank you very much. Thank you for our collective good wishes.